since I've been saved, I've had the unbelievable privilege to see thousands upon thousands of people come to know Christ. And yet I'm singing that song with you this morning and I'm sitting down there going, I still can't believe he saved me. I, I, church, if you ever lose that, you need revival. You, you, y'all hearing what I'm saying? If you ever get past that, the fact that you're saved, if you know Christ, sin's forgiven, and that still doesn't stir your heart a little bit. I, something, something has gone wrong. You may not know the Lord. You may not know him. But if you do, and that doesn't stir your heart, just that thought that he would die for you, he would forgive your sin and give you a brand new life with the assurance of heaven. By the way, one of my favorite parts of all of Scripture, it says that the Holy Spirit who dwells within, I'm not preaching yet, who dwells within us is the down payment of what is yet to come. Hallelujah. Are you kidding me? Y'all ever had to finance something? You richies don't know what I'm talking about, but us poor folk, we had to finance something once in a while, and it's a thing called a down payment, and that's a small, just a snippet of what you're fitting to give those people. Y'all know what I'm talking about? In other words, what is yet to come is so much greater than what you've already given, and he said that the Holy Spirit, whom I can't get over, that he's in me, He helps me, he guides me, he instructs me, he reminds me of scripture. The Bible tells me he comforts me, amen. And he says he's just the beginning of all that I have for you. Hallelujah, amen. Woo, isn't that good? Don't get carried away. All right, John chapter 19, John chapter 19. Here's our text. So this morning, we, you know, we've been going through John, and so we're still marching. We're almost at the end of it. And uh, we've made it into the trials of Jesus. We've got to the end of these trials, and now to the crucifixion. Uh, you remember that they had said, we don't want Jesus released. We would rather have Barabbas Release, and you remember Barabbas is an absolute thug, okay? And so that's what Pilate ends up doing. He releases uh, Barabbas to them. Pilate missed an unbelievable opportunity here uh, to do what was right, uh, but yet he did what was in his mind expedient in trying to protect himself. That's all he did. They take Jesus. Now they go to a bloody cross. There at the cross, if you'll remember. Uh, here through 19, that they the soldiers began to mock him. They 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 gambled for his clothes, and that great statement of Jesus as he hangs there upon the cross, down in verse 30 of chapter 19, he says, "It is." finished. Greek word to telestai. That means it has been completed. Everything that Jesus came here to earth to do, he accomplished it right there on the cross. And what he accomplished, I've been gone too long. I had to teach this to the folks up in Missouri this week. This is not monologue preaching. Y'all understand monologue is where they're just one dude. This is dialogue preaching. Amen. That that means whenever you agree, you, you mm. he accomplished, let me just start that all over. He accomplished everything he came to accomplish. Every sin was paid for, every transgression dealt with, uh, all of the, the wrong that had been committed against God paid for in full, and Jesus stretches out his arms on the cross, and he says to Telestai, it is finished. Then, because the uh, day of preparation for Sabbath had come, uh, they were going to, they, they needed to hurry up because you couldn't have somebody hanging on the cross on the Sabbath. And so, in essence, here's, here's the the. I guess the coarseness, the cruelty of it, they needed them to die quicker. So they came by to um, break their legs 
You've been scourged, now your hands and nails, uh, or nails in your hands and feet. And so because you're just not dying fast enough, we're going to break your legs so that you can no longer, because as you're hanging there, you would have to lift yourself up to take a breath of air and then come back down. If they broke their legs, they could no longer lift themselves. And as a result of it, you ultimately would suffocate hanging there on the cross. When Jesus cries out, it is finished. And then in to the Father's hands, I commit my spirit. He dies there. And when they came to break his legs, he has already been dead. And the soldier then takes a spear and pierces his side. And that's where we pick up uh, our text this morning. I'm about to do something <clears throat> not only have I never done before, but I, I don't... I don't have any examples where others, I've never heard a sermon on the guy we're going to talk about this morning. His name is Joseph of Arimathea, Joseph of Arimathea. So I want you to read here with me, starting in verse 38. If you found it, say amen. Here's what your Bible says. It says, after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and he took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a 100 pounds, and then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. And now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. And so there they laid Jesus because of the Jews preparation day for the tomb was nearby. Lord, I, uh, I so much need your help this morning. Help me, Lord, to be um, faithful to our text uh, in all ways. Um, but Lord, help me, help me this morning to be able to preach with power from on high. Not so that, Lord, I would be remembered, but really, Lord, so I'd be forgotten and you would be remembered and, and heralded from this place. God, I... I, I uh, I just have no doubt there's probably going to be some here this morning that really need to make a decision for Jesus today. I, I, I hope that, God, that as we walk through this text, they will be reminded, Lord, that uh, they can't deny you and deny you and deny you and expect that, Lord, that those moments are not going to run out. Help them today to understand the urgency of the time and respond in a way, Lord, that they too would be able to say, just as I have this morning, I can't believe that Jesus would save my soul. So help me now, lead us in Jesus' name, amen and amen. I wanna approach our text this morning in a little bit of a different way. Actually, it's kind of a completely different way. I wanna preach this invertedly. I, I, I wanna start at the end of it and work our way back up. And I'm really just dealing with one verse. Now that should excite you because that means it's, you know, it's going to be a pretty short message. Amen. Amen. I had a guy at a revival told me years ago, he just came up and felt like, I guess God told him to tell me this. He said, I've never heard a short sermon. I didn't like. Said, well, that's, that's bold. That's a good, easy way of saying, Hey, could you quit rattling on? Um, but I'm dealing with this idea today of secret disciple, a secret disciple. We don't know a lot about Joseph of Arimathea, and that's probably why preachers don't preach much on him. However, Joseph is mentioned in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All of them mention him, yet they all give a little bit of a different glimpse at who this guy is. We know he was rich. He's a very wealthy guy. We know he was a ruler of some kind. Um, be, and, and most scholars that will write about him agree that he 
probably quite possibly was on the Sanhedrin, which was a big deal, meaning he's in a position of power. Uh, so we know all of that, yet John talks about something that none of the rest of them do in his description of him. And so I'm going to talk to you this morning about three issues uh, that are here in Joseph of Arimathea's life that you and I, please hear what I'm about to say, you and I need not duplicate need not duplicate. So I want to give a disclaimer. I'm not here to throw Joseph of Arimathea under the bus. We're not here to tell you he's a bad guy. But I will tell you this, the things that are described of him in verse 38 are really the antithesis of what you and I are called to be as a disciple of Jesus. Now, thankfully, he actually shows up and did a good thing here. Uh, it's a fulfillment of Scripture, and what he did was a very positive thing. But I want to give maybe some warnings here looking at his life that I think we can do better. Number one is I want you to notice here the cemetery confession of Joseph of Arimathea. Well, what's a cemetery confession? Well, that is that you don't show up and show your support until they're dead. Joseph of Arimathea, being this wealthy guy, being this ruler, quite possibly, most likely on the Sanhedrin, has known for some time who Jesus was. He was threat number one in Israel. He, everybody knew about who he was. Everybody knew what he did. Yet what we find is Joseph doesn't show up on the scene to give support uh, until it's really too late. And if you get anything from this today, I want you to hear this. He wasted an unbelievable opportunity to get in on what Jesus was doing while he was here on earth. Wasted opportunities. I literally could take the remainder of our morning plus have a whole series of mornings telling you about wasted opportunities in your pastor's life. Times where I just knew God had opened a door, but yet because I was selfish, because I just didn't want to do it, because maybe I had a bad tooth that day, whatever, I didn't walk through that door and I wasted an opportunity. I believe this is the tragic story of Joseph of Arimathea's life is he waits till this cemetery confession to come before he decides to become a disciple of Jesus, at least in a public way. There's a common myth among people today, even churchgoers, that will say that, that I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live my life, I've got plans for my life, but I'm not going to really get serious about this until the end. I'm going to... I'm going to wait till my deathbed before I get saved. There's a lot of people believe that, whether you realize it or not. How do you know that? I've counseled with too many of them on their deathbed over the years that have had that belief that I'm just, I'm going to wait to the end. I'm going to wait till it's nearly all over. That way I've lived life my way and then I can go out God's way. Can I just tell you, there's going to be a lot of people, a lot of people. Please hear what I'm saying. A lot of people. What are you trying to say? A lot of people in hell that waited for a cemetery confession that never came. A lot of people. I got some living left to do. I would submit to you on the authority of the word of God, you don't know what living is without a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so he waited. He waited all the way till Jesus was already dead. By the way, this also, I thought of this this week as I'm studying this text. I've talked to so many preachers, every preacher I can catch. Uh, I've, I've asked, have you ever preached on Joseph of Arimathea? No, I haven't. Have you ever heard of anybody that's preached on? Well, no, no, I haven't. I'm like, well, I'm going to tell you what I'm fitting to say. And I said, you tell me if I'm wrong. And they're like, I don't know. I've never preached on him. But one of the things that, that came to my mind looking at this cemetery confession was this. Let's say that he was on board well before this. What's the big deal? Here's the big deal. He never went public with it until it was too late. I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, but I've experienced what it is to have silent supporters. 
I've experienced what it is to have people that would privately come to me and say, hey, I'm with you, uh, you know, brother, I, I'm, I support you, but yet an opportunity publicly comes along for them to do so. All of a sudden, they've got not a single word to say. And I'll just tell you this, I'd rather deal with an outright enemy than a silent supporter. Y'all hear, at least I know where they stand. But to say, hey, privately, hey, just between you and I, now don't bring this up anymore, between you and I, I agree with you, I'm with you, I support you, but then opportunity comes to, to actually take a stand and do what is right. They just mums the word. I'm just, uh, it's, it's cowardice. And then wait till they're dead and gone or wait till, they, I've seen this scenario with pastors that have been run off from their churches and talking to them was like, yeah, they, I had all kinds of people telling me they supported me, but yet they wouldn't do it publicly until I was gone. And well, it's too late. I've seen it happen in local schools. We supported our administration or we supported that coach, but you'd never say anything public. That's not the the people that God has called us to be. As a matter of fact, everything I can find calls us to courageous living, to be bold uh, uh, in our witness of, of who Christ is and what he's done in our life. And so if it's right, we ought to be bold about it. I'm not saying a bunch of bucket mouths. I'm saying bold about what we believe, what we stand for as a people. Not wait till folks are dead and gone to take a stand with them. If you're here this morning and you're waiting for your deathbed, I need you to know what a gamble, what a risk you're taking. Because some of you may not get a bed to die on. And it happens so suddenly. Whether it be in a car, whether it be walking down a sidewalk and There's not this period of time where you can sit and reflect back over life and reflect about uh, where you've been, what you've done, contemplate about where you're heading, and then make this great, grandiose decision about Jesus. If you'll study your New Testament, you'll find that he comes and knocks, but there's going to be a time whenever the knocking will stop. Because my Bible tells me that we are to seek him while he is near and while he may be found. So if I can give a warning of anything this morning, I'm warning you don't wait for a cemetery confession. The second thing I would notice here in our text is he had a cowardice problem. Look there with me. It says that he was a disciple of Jesus secretly, but listen to the, the language here. It says, for fear of the Jews. For fear of the Jews. His fear caused him to go into hiding. His fear caused him to keep his mouth shut. Here's what I'm going to tell you. It's never going to get easier to serve Jesus in America. I believe that with every fiber of my being. There's never going to be an easier day than right now to serve Jesus in America. If you can't be bold today, please don't wait for persecution because I'm telling you persecution will give you a case of the lockjaw if you can't do it during freedom. We ought to celebrate the freedom that we have in Christ in this country. Our country's a hot mess right now, but here's what I'm telling you. It's going to get worse. When I read my Bible, I can't find a single thing that tells me anything about the United States of America in the end times. Not one thing. And you, listen, you cut me, I bleed the star-spangled banner. I love this country. I'm patriotic as they come. But listen to me. My allegiance is to the kingdom of heaven. I will not be an American for all eternity. I will be a Christian for all eternity. And what I find when I read my Bible is this absence of mentioning the United States of America. That tells me it has a shelf life like every other nation on earth has had a shelf life. And guess what happens as you come to the end of that shelf life? It gets hard. It gets difficult. It gets painful. I think that there's coming a day very soon that it's going to be really challenging for us 
to live out our faith in the public square. And here, I'm just, can I be honest this morning? I don't know why preachers say that, like I've been lying all the rest of the time. I'm not sure we're ready. I'm not sure we're ready. Church, COVID decimated the American church. It scattered us like a covey of quail. And there's still people, listen to me, there's still people by the droves all over this country that once were hooked up, man, they're in the church, man, they're a part of it, but all of a sudden COVID came and they've not been back. They went silent. What I'm telling you is this, if there was a day to cast out fear, it's this day. Don't you wait until what the day I really have to. I want you to listen to what uh, John penned over in 1 John. He said, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we where? In this world. As he already is, so are we in this world. Why can I have boldness on the day of judgment? Because I've had boldness as I walk through this world. He said, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Translate that. He hasn't been saved. We love him because he first loved us. Preacher, why are you being bold about this? Because where I started this morning, I've been saved. The only thing that gives me, it's not my personality, it's my salvation. It's my new nature. I know what he's done for me. I know what he's done in me, to me, what he's done through me. As a result of that, I can be bold. I can shout my voice to, on the, the rooftops. Listen, Jesus and Jesus alone saves. And if we can't take a stand now, I'm just telling you, you are crazy if you think you'll take a stand then. He had a cowardice problem. Let me give you the last one. He had a concealment issue. He had a cemetery confession. I'm waiting until it's all over and then I'm going to speak. He had a cowardice problem. His fear drove him underground. But he has this concealment issue. It said that he was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly. Secretly. Why? He had a lot to lose. He really did. Y'all hearing what I'm saying? He, he, Joseph had a lot to lose. He's wealthy. He's in a seat of power. This is why he's doing it secretly. Joseph is trying to hang on to his old life while he's trying to embrace this new life. You see a lot of people doing that today. I want to be, I don't, I mean, think about this. Let's line up 100 people and we're just going to ask them one question as you come through, all right? We're just going to kind of pray you through like we're vaccinating cattle, all right? Do you want to go to hell? I don't think we're going to have a lot of yeses. You don't have to be all that intelligent to figure that out. Hell's not a good place to go. And the more educated you get about what the Bible says about hell, you absolutely, so, so we understand that. There's not a lot, there's not a big movement of people saying, man, I can't wait for hell. He had a, He had a concealment issue because he's trying to hang on to all of his stuff, all of his life, but I'd like to have this box checked where I don't go to hell in the end. Well, what's the problem? Here, here it is. I'm going to sum it up this way. I've read my Bible a lot. I've read it through and through a lot. I have yet to find... This picture, this example, or certainly this calling for you, me, or anyone else to know Jesus as Savior 
but not as Lord. Did you kind of catch what I just threw at you? It's the idea, and I've just described somebody that would want to know him as Savior, but not Lord. Meaning, I want to be saved. I understand the Bible says I deserve hell. Sin separated me from God. Because of my sin, I deserve hell. Torment for all eternity. I understand that. I don't want to go there. I still, though, however, would love to control my own life. Listen to me, ma'am and sir. I'm going to love you enough to tell you straight, you cannot do that. You cannot divide who Christ was and say, I'd like to have the benefit of this, but you're not getting access over here. It's Listen to me, it's all or nothing. We're not going to short sell the gospel so that more people would make decisions. The church has done too much of that. I could do that this morning. We'd have all kinds of folks raising their hand, oh, I want in. Preachers that I just say this prayer and come up and get, get baptized. I'm, I'm good, amen. And then we can go right back to our life and just live however we want to live. No, no, you, you can do that, but you're going to go to hell. I'm going to love you enough to tell you it's, it's all or nothing. You're all in or you're all out. You're 100% saved or you're 100% lost. He had this concealment issue that reminds me of a verse of scripture that I have quoted to you 10,000 times. It's in Matthew chapter 10. I want you to hear it and then we'll pray. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. You'll know it because you've heard, if you've been here very long, you've heard me say this so many times. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But, but, I think it's the worst conjunction in all of the Bible. But, whoever denies me, before men him I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. I'll deny him. Why are you going to deny him, Jesus? Because they denied me before others. That's why. Do you see where concealment gets you? Now here again, I, I don't know Joseph of Arimathea. All I know is what the Bible tells me. He's rich, he's a ruler, and he shows up out of secrecy and takes the body of Jesus. Did a good thing here at the end. So I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt and say he, he finished well. I'm thankful for the grace of God that allowed him to finish strong here. But his example is the complete opposite of what you and I have been called to live. We have been called to come ye out from among them and be ye separate. We have been called to be a bold witness of faith. You'll remember as we go through the book of Acts, what, what is Paul in the, the new church, the New Testament church praying? That God, in persecution, even by the way, God give us boldness. I'm not, I'm wanting to pray, God zap the bad guys. Amen. I mean, that just sounds so much more effective. Hey, zap the bad guys. Well, why didn't they pray that? Because it's the bad guys that needed Jesus. God, give us boldness that we would speak as we ought to speak. I wonder if you have a concealment problem this morning. Your heart, you're saved, and your heart, oh, I'm, yeah, I know where I'm going. Here's my question to you. I wonder if anybody else knows. And by the way, I'm not asking whether or not you have it in a social media profile. Y'all hearing what I'm saying? I think you know where I'm headed here. That it, it, we're not talking about whether or not you tip your hat to God from time to time. I'm talking about does he, does he have all of you? All of you. Does he have your, your weekends as much as your weekdays? Does he have your home as much as your work, as much as where you play? Does he have your group you hang out with when you hang out with your buddies, your girlfriends? Does he have all of you? 
And here's my last question, and we're, we're done. Do you know with certainty this morning that you know him? I'm convinced with everything that I've read in the Bible as well as what I've experienced in my own life, here's a surefire way to know you won't be ashamed. You just won't be ashamed. If you've given your heart to Jesus, you've trusted in him, you will not be ashamed of him.